Now, in all the anticipation of this upcoming final series, there are nine games left to decide who is going to be AFL Premiers for 2020. There have been 10 teams that have been forgotten by half the competition. That's right, I'm talking about the losers. There are 10 teams who missed out on finals in 2020. And in this video, I'm gonna be taking you through a short summary of their season, giving them a letter grade, and talking a little bit about what they can do this off season to improve for 2021. So if your team didn't make the finals, they are gonna be featured in this video. In the words of the infamous Drake, I'm gonna start from the bottom and have a look at the Adelaide Crows first of all. Now they were a much talked about team this season obviously nearly went the whole season winless under new coach Matthew Nix it took into the last three or four weeks for them to actually get on the board and we were talking about this team as though they were one of the worst of all time. Now it really has been a slow decline pretty much since that 2017 grand final God knows what happened on that preseason camp but for whatever reason this club has been driven into the ground and in 2020 they absolutely hit rock bottom. The adversity started many years ago, but this is the year that the resilience broke down and they really had to restart from scratch. There was an exodus of players, a new coach, rumors of terrible culture since that camp in particular, leading ultimately to this club's first wooden spoon. Now, as I said before, it took them a while to get going. And particularly in that first part of that season, I was concerned that I couldn't really see their future blossoming through like you can with some other rebuilding clubs. Now, this really wasn't too much through fault of their own. A lot of their prospects just hadn't really been exposed at AFL level to this point and were a little less physically developed than some young guns at other clubs. But in that last month or so of the season, they won three of their last four, I think it was, beat some pretty good teams. And you can really start to see the shoots coming through. You got guys like Chase Jones played some good footy, Himmelberg, Lockie Scholl won the final Rising Star nomination of the season, Harry Schoenberg, we know about Darcy. Fogarty and of course Fisher Mackesy at the back there. They've still got a lot of recruiting to do but you can start to see these guys starting to come through the ranks. Their high point of the season was undoubtedly beating GWS last year's grand finalists but their low point was a 69 point loss to North Melbourne who were second last at the time and in fact they finished second last as well. You have to grade Adelaide as an F for this year while we do kind of give them a pass for being a rebuilding side and having a lot of adversity, other than that last four weeks, it couldn't really have gone much worse. In terms of their off-season strategy, it's a bad year to have pick one because they don't really have true access to pick one. It looks like Jamara Hagen will be going to the Dogs via Academy, but they still should have some pretty good talent available to them. I believe they have GWS's first rounder as well. And if they happen to let Brad Crouch leave the club, which I really don't think they should do, they could potentially have three top 10 picks. My first advice would be trying to hang on to Brad Crouch. He's not too old for your club. You're gonna need experienced players to support the young guys coming through, but they're looking at bringing Jackson Haitley home from GWS, which would be an absolute bargain. But I'd be looking at two other expansion players in Will Brody and Jai Caldwell as well to really try and supplement their young stocks. Let's move on to North Melbourne, who of course finished second last. And this is a surprising result for them. Even though if you look at their list profile, you can sort of see why they would finish sort of lower on the ladder. They are usually a strong competitive team. So I didn't expect a season quite like this from them. We saw that under Brad Scott, they tried to top up and sort of play for the here and now, but to contrast that, Reese Shaw has come in and they've cut 11 players during this off season. They're shipping off Ben Brown. As you can see from another video I made last week, I think they may be cutting a little bit too hard and it might be a little bit reactionary from the season they had. They did have some pretty good performances beating GWS in Sydney. There is a bit to play with there and some young players really took the next step for them. In particular, someone like Jai Simpkin is going to be really important for taking this club forward. You can see that Reshaw has got a completely opposite mindset to Brad Scott. He wants to cut hard and he wants to rebuild this club through the draft, it seems. They're a proud club. This was an inexplicably poor year and they need to get better. But with guys like Jai Simpkin, Cam Zerha, LDU and Aaron Thomas, they've already got a good young nucleus starting to develop as well. They just need to keep supplementing that. I don't think getting rid of experienced guys like Brown or God forbid Polek is the answer, but it remains to be seen what they would get for players like those. I've actually got their high point of the season beating the Saints in round one, coming out from like six goals down and the Saints ended up playing finals and their low point was an 11 goal loss to the Gold Coast Suns. I'm going to give them an F because I truly believe their preseason expectations would have been better than a bottom two finish. In terms of their strategy, 
strategy. I would only trade Brown for a very good offer, which I don't think they will actually get. So I'm worried they're going to let him go for a discount. Uh, but then I'd also be looking at target someone like a Brad Crouch, who's only 25, 26. I think he does fit their profile well. And again, I'll mention Jai Caldwell and Will Brody, some undervalued talents at other clubs who are not getting an opportunity. Next up, we've got the Sydney Swans. And at the start of the year, I did peg them as a spoon contender. I think I had them bottom two or three with the Gold Coast Suns and the Adelaide Crows. They did win in round one, which was a pretty good win, but they did spend chunks of this year without Josh Kennedy, Isaac Heaney, and in particular, Buddy Franklin didn't play a game. That is a lot of experience for a young team to lose out on. When you say it like that, I would have said a wooden spoon would have been fairly forgivable in this particular year, uh, but the fact that they avoided one is a bit of a win, even if they are trending the wrong way across the ladder. The up and down performances make sense for a young team, and I've praised their youth before, but what I did find interesting was that they have no players in the 22 under 22 team and only one rising star nomination this year in Justin McInerney. That isn't the be all and end all because I think they do have a lot of young talent, but it also isn't a hugely promising sign for a rebuilding side. In terms of the positive, you got James Roybottom really come up and surprise a few people with how good he's been. He was a warrior alongside Luke Parker in that midfield and their back line is pretty solid as ever with Rampy, Lloyd and Callum Mills also playing really good roles in defense. Their forward line is a little bit of a basket case with no Buddy Franklin. We saw a really strong over-reliance on Tom Papley this year. It looks like he'll be staying with the club, but either way, I think they really need to supplement their forward talent. In terms of their highs and lows, their best performance was a win over the Giants, and their worst performance was getting smashed by Freo and also maybe conceding that seven-goal loss to Carlton. I'm going to give them a C-. minus. Again, I tipped them to finish around this range and they had really bad injuries, so it's really hard to rate them too harshly based on that performance. Now, Sydney are a side that don't like to spend too far down the ladder, I guess because of the Sydney market being a little bit disinterested in footy, they need to stay competitive. So I actually think Sydney are sort of primed to get a mature talent, potentially even a big fish to join their club. Joe Danaher probably doesn't make a lot of sense for me. Maybe they really do feel like buddies on their last legs, but how do you play those guys in the same team? In terms of goal scoring talent though, I would be looking at Harry Perryman, who looks unsigned at the moment at their crosstown rivals, the Giants. And I also think they really need to add a ruck. Let's move on to the last bottom four team, and that is the Hawthorne Hawks. And for a side that is trying to circumvent a rebuild with some high profile trades in the last few years, they've ended up in the bottom four anyway. They've made those trades for high profile players undoubtedly to try and avoid a bottom four finish and a proper rebuild. So I think out of the bottom four teams this year, they will be the most bitter about the way this season transpired. Round one was pretty good for them where they beat the Lions convincingly at the MCG, but they did not come back well from the COVID delay by getting slaughtered by their rivals Geelong at GMHBA Stadium. This year could turn out to be a blessing in disguise in the long term because of what it does do is give them some pretty good access to talent as they hold pick four in this year's draft, which is their earliest pick in quite some time. Retirements are happening, Puopolo's gone, Stratton's gone, and there may even be some other moves with Jack Gunston being targeted from Collingwood. I do think he'll stay, but my point being, the transition continues at Hawthorne. One cruel blow for them is Sicily's ACL. He's a young talent. I guess he's fairly mature, but even still to have a guy of his talent out for what I presume will be the whole 2021 season, that is a major blow. I do still think with the quality they have on the list that with a bit of a mental refresh, they could push for finals again next year. They probably do have some quality unproven youth on the list, but they really need to flesh that out. In particular, Will Day and Finn McGuinness played some footy this year and uh, the former played pretty good footy at times. For me, I think it's time they need to bite the bullet and put some investment into this draft. Their high point this year would have been that win over the Brisbane Lions and their low point would have been that loss to the Adelaide Crows at Adelaide Oval. I'm going to give this season an F purely because I think Hawthorne are capable of a lot more. And in terms of their off-field strategy, they need to go for young talent. It doesn't necessarily have to be through the draft. I'm again going to mention Jai Caldwell, a young Victorian talent who is undervalued at a GWS side that frankly can't fit him in. And maybe they look at a running defender, sort of replace Sicily. They're not quite the same player, but someone like Adam Saad, if he doesn't stay at Essendon, could be a reasonable choice for this Hawks side. Now let's take a look at the Gold Coast Suns who started this season pretty well. They won three on the trot and looked a finals contender, particularly when they annihilated the West Coast Eagles in the comeback game of the COVID restart. Similar to the year before though, they really ran out of steam. And since that opening run, they went two, 10 and one with the one being the draw. 
Having said that, their percentage is over 90%, which is a really encouraging metric for a young team. To contrast it with last year, I can say now you can clearly see the young nucleus that is going to take this club forward, which you wouldn't have said 12 to 24 months ago. You look at guys like Matty Rao, who barely played, but is obviously a very big talent. Isaac Rankin, Noah Anderson, who I think came second in the Rising Star. Ben King, Jack Lacocious, Ben Ainsworth, Jack Bowes, Charlie Ballard. The list goes on. The talent there is starting to develop. You actually can see these guys playing a good role at AFL level. On top of that, their mature pickups have been great. Brendan Ellis and Hugh Greenwood really stood up in that midfield and played the exact role that they really wanted their mature recruits to do in the last few years, but to not the same level of success. And to be honest, I've got to shout out Sam Collins as being one of the great success stories of AFL, a former D-listee from the Fremantle Dockers, won their best and fairest, which is a huge achievement even for a side that finished fifth last. To summarize, even though they only jumped up a few spots on the ladder, this was clearly Gold Coast's best season in a long time, and it's a stark contrast to where they were 12 months ago. Their high point was thrashing the West Coast Eagles, and uh, I'd say the low point was actually the game before that, getting smashed by Port. Everything other than that was a fairly solid performance. I'd give them a B for this season because what we really needed to see was hope for the future, and we've seen that, but I probably won't give them an A because their final finish to the season really was quite poor. In terms of off-season moves, I think just to sort of retain the kids they've got, you want to keep playing those kids in the positions that is going to help them develop. In terms of mature talent, they've been linked to Adelaide's Rory Atkins, who's exploring free agency. So maybe that will help with a little bit of depth. And they've also got to make decisions on Will Brody or Peter Wright, who are getting some interest from Victorian clubs. If they can't get much time at the Suns, maybe it is time to flip them for a pick so that they can sort of balance out their list a bit better. Let's move on to the Essendon Bombers, who started 5-2 and two, and then typically won only two of their next 12, which is a very, very Essendon kind of season to have. In their defense, they did have big injuries. You had Danaher, Stringer, Heppel, Zaharakis, and Fantasia all missing significant chunks of the season, which would make it very hard for any team to really make a finals push. They're in a kind of a weird in-between situation where obviously you had the outgoing John Worsfold and the incoming Ben Rutten sort of transition between two game styles, which would have been quite awkward for the players, I think. And while they fell quite a way short of their goal of making the finals, because they made the finals last year, that really should have been their goal. They did have some emerging talent take a big step in particular, Jordan Ridley won their best and fairest. And I think he was only the 2015 draft. So a pretty young guy to win their best and fairest. Uh, and then you've got Andrew McGrath, Kyle Langford, and Darcy Parrish all take the next step. In fact, I've got it written down here. Ridley has won their best and fairest despite playing 26 games. I don't know what the record is for modern day footy, but that would stack up fairly well. It's an awkward one for the Bombers. Inconsistent performances again, but you've kind of got your excuses. That being said, we're just seeing more of the same from this footy club. It's still very hard to gauge what this team is capable of because on their day, they've proven to be a very, very good and damaging team. And on their worst day, they're one of the worst teams in the competition. Their high point was beating Collingwood in round five in a really, really good performance that surprised us all. And their low point was probably their round now in clash, which we live streamed against the Brisbane Lions where they barely put up a yield. In terms of grade, I'm going to give them a D. They had a bit of adversity, but again, no one can be happy with a 13th or 14th finish, whatever it was. On the plus side though, they have got a little bit out of this year with some young emerging talent taking that next step. In terms of their off-season strategy, you look at guys like Orazio Fantasia, who wanted to lead the club last year. They're going to have to do something with him. I don't really know if he's likely to go or stay, but they're going to try and have to extract as much value out of that deal as they can. And potentially, if uh, Joe Danaher does lead the club this off-season as well, which, again, I have no idea if he's going to, but they'd be looking at Ben Brown and Tom McDonald. So I guess it's kind of a good position to be in where they have some good key forwards on the move this off-season. Next up, we've got Fremantle, who actually improved this year despite having some injury bad luck in the preseason. I remember talking them down a little bit on their expectations because of how many key players were going to miss footy. It took a while for them to come good, but that is very much expected when you've got a new coach and a young team. Again, they're still recovering from players leaving. This is a yearly occurrence for the Dockers. Brad Hill obviously joined the Saints, and with three top 10 picks, the focus really was to develop a game plan with a new coach and also get games into this young up-and-coming list. Ironically, out of their three picks that were taken last year, out of the three of them, the least talked about probably was Caleb Sarong, and he ended up winning the Rising Star and looks an absolute young inside mid bull in that team. We haven't seen too much of Hayden Young or Liam Henry yet, but they are very good talents as well. So they're in a good position in that respect. I always thought their back line was their strength, in particular with Hamling and Pierce. 
being really good tall pillars down back, but both of them missed most of the season this year. Thankfully for them, they did have some young up and coming defenders really take that next level. And they kind of shun even without them. You got Griffin Logue, even Ethan Hughes stood up this year. And obviously Luke Ryan earned his first All Australian nomination as well. The midfield is looking pretty good with Brayshaw and Chera stepping up this year, supported by Sarong. For me, their forward line is still the issue. Despite Tabana having a best season where he was actually nominated for the MVP award as one of the three Dockers. Even though Hogan came good at the end of the season as well, I still think a glaring concern for that list is avenues to goal. In fact, they only averaged 51 points a game in season 2020, which is ranked 16th out of 18 clubs. The high point of their season was probably their big comeback against the Saints, the eventual finalists. And their low point of the season was a game I actually attended with Druzy and they kicked two goals, four against Geelong. Even though they didn't play that poorly, I think it was a very, very sorry scoreline at the end of the night. I'm gonna give them a B for their performances this season. They've improved a little bit and they're also getting improvement out of the right guys. In terms of their off season strategy, I think they can sort of just sit and chill for a little bit. They're gonna have to focus on retention of their stars the first year in a while they haven't lost someone half decent in terms of drafting maybe also look at an outside mid to, to support the recruits in Aish and Akers who went all right this year but outside run with Hill and Langdon leaving is still probably a concern and then maybe a young key position forward like a Logan McDonald if they can trade up to get him that would be ideal next up we have the Carlton Blues and they're a team many expected to rise up the ladder this year I was probably a little bit more reluctant to peg them as a team that was really going to push all the way to finals and they've kind of settled exactly where I saw them this year. It's not really because I doubted the quality of their list. I just wondered if they were quite ready to take that next step. And to some extent, I was vindicated because they had a 7-10 and 10 season, but they dropped six games from winning positions even though they've clearly taken a step, they really did kind of have an almost season. The best way to characterize their season is to say that they scored in bunches, they gave away big leads, and they overcame big deficits. So there's a clear inconsistency there. There's this much talked about 30 point swing that David Teague is prone to giving up. I believe 18 out of 28 games he's coached, they've conceded a five goal swing. So they really need to improve the way they control momentum swings from the opposition. On the plus side, we did see again, young players take a next step, none more so than Jay. Jake Wiedering, who was definitely a candidate for All-Australian contention. And you've kind of got Tom DeConning as well, who showed signs he's going to need to step up again next year with no cruiser, along with Mark Pitney. It was great to see Sam Doherty back on the field and returning in a big way. On the downside, however, we saw Paddy Cripps sort of ragtagged all season, and we didn't really see the best football he's capable of. Their high point of the season was undoubtedly Jack Noon's goal after the siren up the stadium to shatter purple hearts throughout Perth. And also their away win to GMHBA. It's hard to actually split those two wins. That was a massive performance as well. And their low point, even though the Crows were playing better footy at the time, losing to the Crows is still a little bit of a blemish on the record. I'm going to give them a C plus for this season. I think they've tracked along fairly well without really blowing us away. In terms of their off-season strategy, I'm going to say they probably need some speed and rebound, which puts them in contention for someone like an Adam Sard. Although, of course, we did see that they virtually signed Zach Williams. I say virtually. We saw what happened with Papley last year. But it looks like Zach Williams is a go. Maybe they could supplement that with an Adam Sard as well, who I believe they're talking to. They could also look at someone like a Brad Crouch if they feel like they need to supplement their mature midfield stocks, which wouldn't be the worst idea. Second to last, we have GW West, last year's grand finalist, who have shockingly missed the finals and they've continued that trend where teams who get belted in grand finals don't come back quite the same the next year. They really did have a terrible year but culminated with them dropping their captain, Stephen Canelio, which would have been absolutely unthinkable 12 months ago. Something seems a little bit off with this Giants team who went eight and nine this season, so a losing record. And this is bad timing for a club that's got a bit of a salary squeeze. On the field, their issues were really about generating inside 50s. They were ranked 16th for inside 50s, but top four for conversion version. So evidently their forward line did their job from limited opportunities. In fact, they lost inside 50s in their first four wins of the season, which really tells the tale there. They did stay in the hunt for finals for most of the season to their credit, but by their final round loss to the Saints after halftime, it was clear to see this team clearly wasn't engaged. Their coach Leon Cameron summed it up when he said that effort and consistency wasn't there this year and they need to regain the respect of the AFL community, which is true. Their high point was a really good performance in round one before the COVID delay against the Geelong Cats. 
and their low point was that final round loss to the Saints where they really didn't give up whelp in that second half and also their big loss to the Swans in Perth out of nowhere. I'm going to give this team an F because they're capable of so much more and we're going to see a little bit of an exodus this offseason. Zach Williams seems to have gone, Aiden Kaur seems to have gone and then it seems almost like a foregone conclusion that Jackson Haightley is leaving, Harry Perryman might be off to port, Jai Caldwell, Xavier O'Halloran are all out of contract. It sounds like they might be successful in keeping Jeremy Cameron but at this time I make this video that is still no guarantee either. In terms of what they can get in, they're going to need to look at a cheap ruck with Shane Mumford at 34 years old and Sam Jacobs retiring. All right, final team to look at is the Melbourne Demons. They were 2019's disappointment story, although they sort of made up a little ground in 2020. Specifically, they gained four wins in 2020 and their percentage went up by 30%. So we did really see a different team this year. On the positive side for them, you had some individual brilliance. Christian Petrarca came out to be one of the best players in the competition this year and is really starting to hit the potential we knew he was capable of. On top of that, Max Gorn had one of his better seasons as an individual after a couple of down years back there. Clayton Oliver is still putting up great performances in the midfield supported by Jack Viney and we finally saw the potential that Stephen May had playing out of that back line as well. While they had individual success, the team success was not quite good enough and this team is capable for finals and there were some really poor performances there throughout the year which ultimately cost them finals. Again, like a few other teams in this review, their biggest issue was consistency. Their best wins were really great where they annihilated Collingwood, but they had bad losses to the Swans and Fremantle in particular where they weren't quite in the contest. On the positive side, it is a big positive jump from where they were last year. So they've regained some ground, but this side probably is capable of more based on where they were two years ago. I touched on it before. The high point was the win over Collingwood. The low point, probably that loss to Sydney, considering that Fremantle were playing some good, good footy at that time. In terms of their off-wheel strategy, there's not a whole lot they can do because they don't hold a first round of this year. I think their first pick at the moment is around about 22. What they will need to look at is some pace and skill. They would be in the market for Jared Polak if he were available and Adam Saad if they can convince him to come over. But other than that, it may be a draft only sort of year for the Demons. All right, guys, there you have it. That is my review of the 10 teams who miss the finals. As always, I welcome your opinions in the comments section. Let me know where you differ from what I said. If you want 20% off Manscaped products, use the code in the description, TRUEFOOTY20, all one word, all caps. And also go check out my other podcast, Cold World. Again, link in the description. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.